So Vauder is ready to go. We're ready to go. And as you can see, our camera operator in center field is going to have the hardest job <laughs> in sports broadcasting here tonight. Might be hanging on for dear life <laughs> out there in center field. It, it's dry. There are some great clouds, but we haven't had any <laughs> rain today. But the wind is howling here, and it's going to be a huge factor. Big gusts. First pitch on the ground, and with very little work from Vauder. We have an out here in the top of the first as Reagan Johnson is retired. Ania Black tags her out, one away. It's a prime example of exactly what you're going to see from Vauder when she's out there in the circle. That heavy, heavy drop ball that she throws with some great velocity. She's going to try to induce as many ground ball outs as she possibly can. Here's Reagan Kramer, who takes strike one. Starting lineup for the Razorbacks, Johnson, Kramer, then Ellis, Kennedy Miller, the freshman, then Hannah Gamble. A lot of power in this lineup. 47 home runs, and they hit four home runs in the last series against Mizzou. 0-2 the count now to Kramer. Vauder's 27th appearance, the team leader in innings pitched with 117, as Maddie mentioned. Drop ball, she'll keep it on the ground today, which will be key on a windy night here at Carolina. She gets strikeout number 78 on the season. Two away. Tell me more about Vauder because she's been one of the top stories in the SEC this year coming over from Stanford. She's really one of the best pitchers in the country because of that heavy drop ball that she'll throw to both sides of the plate. So she's going to keep you honest. You can't just sit on one side. She's got a change up that she will throw in any count. And of course, she comes over to South Carolina with just a ton of experience. Ball one to Bree Ellis. Ellis at 370 on the season. Those 13 home runs, 40 runs batted in. Outstanding OPS, 1258 on the season. Good for first on the team. Two for eight with a homer in the Mizzou series. Trying to work her inside, and it's one and one. That was a good series for Arkansas against the 11th ranked Tigers. One game, one, five, two. They were run ruled in game number two, but Courtney Diefel's team bounced back. A couple of home runs from Carter and Halverson, the difference in a 4-1 game. Off speed, misses, it's two and one. Always curious too, when you get these types of matchups, Vodder in the circle, Bree Ellis up at the plate. How are we going to see Vodder pitch to her. Is she going to try to see if she can get Ellis to swing outside of the zone, work the drop balls way low and away, not even give her anything close to hit? Right there, another off-speed pitch outside. Or does she take the wind into account too, knowing that it's going to be a little bit more challenging to get the ball out of the yard, although Brie Ellis has all sorts of power coming from that right side. The wind is blowing straight from right to the left field line. It's blowing really towards that third base dugout more than anything. So I don't know how much, but it swirls, Maddie. I mean, we've been watching it. Sometimes it blows out towards the left field foul pole. Anything in the air is going to be an adventure. Well, we were using my hair as an indicator when we were no. down on the field before the game <laughs> it, just it to is, see how much the wind was swirling. And yes, my, I mean, my hair was swirling It all is over an the place. entertaining weather vane, I have to say. When you, you're way too young to remember this. Uh, Google it after the game. Cousin It from the Adams I family. Know, I know what are, that are you familiar with this? Yes, that, okay. that's exactly what I look like down on the field. <laughs> my <Ellis> expert <laughs> meteorologist analysis right there using my hair. There's strike one to the cleanup hitter, Kennedy Miller. Freshman outstanding debut for this Arkansas team this season. Second on the team in hitting at 382 on the season. Numbers weren't great in the Mizzou series. She was 0 for 7. Down to the count, 0 and 2. I don't think Courtney Diefel was too concerned about that 0 for 7. She says this young lady right here has been very consistent, very good all season, and you're not going to get a hit in every single game, but she's been close, it seems, this year. That misses one and two. Yeah, for a freshman, she holds herself to an extremely high standard, but Coach Dyfel said that she stays very even keeled throughout the season, doesn't there, get too oh. high with the high, doesn't get too low with the lows, and how about that strategy there? Do not get too high 
uh, beyond those shoulders there because you would blow away. That bow in the hair would be like a spinnaker <laughs> carrying you to the, <laughs> to the outfield. That's in the dirt. Ellis holds it first. It's two and two. That bow was hanging in there, though. I'm surprised that, that it is was still on I don't head. know how it's affixed. Some sort of super fastening. Are those raindrops moving in? I was as told as there was no something. rain in the forecast. I'm just going to go ahead and put that one on you, Eric. As soon as you said something, that's when the weather decided to shift a bit the on The sun us. is out, Madison. It's a sun shower. We'll be fine. <laughs> Ground ball to shortstop. Blankenship across the first to retire the side. On against the South Carolina offense. Do not give them any free passes, anything that they could try to create some chaos on the base pass. Picked up the two wins in the Missouri series, had a 1-5-4 earned run average, went 13 and two-thirds, struck out 14. Line stock ready to work to South Carolina here in the first. Riley Blampy to lead things off, the senior center fielder at 306 on the season. And strike one from Linestock. Denver Bryant follows Blampede in the starting lineup. Zoe Leno, Jen Cummings, Keanu Jones, Anaya Black, Bree Warren is starting in left. Elena Vauder will hit for herself, so two-way player, and Blankenship the shortstop batting ninth. Grounded foul, and it's 0-2 to Blampede. The issue right now for South Carolina comes at the plate. They are struggling right now to find base hits. They are last in the SEC hitting 241. They're just not a team that really hits for a ton of home run power. You can see that Keanu Jones leading the team with five home runs. Drastically different than the stats that you look at on as far as the Arkansas Razorbacks go, who's a team that's primarily known for their power. You see Coach Bev Smith standing next to new hitting coach for South Carolina this year, Coach Jake Epstein, just trying to figure out what are going to be the right pieces to put together in the lineup to try to produce some runs for their great pitching staff that they have. Line shot foul. Blampede had a couple of hits in the Mississippi State series. That was a series where Bulldogs won two out of three. See at 241, the 20 home runs. That's last in the SEC. If they get on base, they will use the running game a little bit. 43 steals, good for sixth in the conference. That's skipped up there for a ball from Linestock. And I think this is a series, too, where if you get people on base, try to play a little bit more small ball. Maybe try to put a runner in motion with a hit and run, or if you get a runner all the way to third base, possibly try a squeeze. There are some other ways to score that don't just necessarily rely on a home run every single time. Grounded foul when we talked to Bev Smith this week about the issues at the plate. She said that usually she's someone who likes to have a fixed lineup and just tweak it minimally, but she is still working on trying to find the right combination. And it may not seem late, but it's late in the season now as we hit the middle of April. This is definitely the time of the year where you would love to have a set lineup so that your players can get into that day-to-day -day routine, try to figure out which combination is going to work best. Maybe you can play some matchup scenarios, but for the most part, you'd love to have a set lineup that you're going to throw out there every single day. And for South Carolina, just still trying to figure out what's going to be the best combination for them offensively moving forward. Wow, crazy wind gun. I, I'm going to say this is how windy it is right now. The beach volleyball venue is beyond right field. And they're, it's blowing so hard that there's sand. Now over at the track and field complex, there's some of the apparatus blowing around there in the, the high jump pit. We just got a crazy wind gust. That one's fouled back, but don't quit on any foul ball because it could come back into play. I, I want to just give all the love and credit to camera four. That's Dave out there. You may, if you've watched a lot of South Carolina games here, you may notice that the view from center field looks a little different. We've had to lower the lift down because it's so windy. And so it's a little lower angle from center field than normally because if we, if Dave goes up any higher, he he's, might end he, up on track Dave's and field. Doing, <laughs> Dave's doing a Mary Poppins and he is gone. <laughs> we don't want that. We want Dave to stay right there. Dave, in do you field. have sandbags attached to your belt? <laughs> Nod once for yes. Yes. Oh, no. Two hands on that camera, young man. This is a great at bat from Blampede to get things started here. 
And these are the little things, too, that help get your offense going. Having your leadoff batter go up there and just see pretty much everything that you're going to see out of Morgan Linestock in the very first at bat of this ball game. We've already seen a ton of those drop balls, and she is just fighting them off left and right, even up in the box, just a little bit against Linestock here. Pitch number 12 of the at-bat hits her. So Blampede has a souvenir from that long at-bat. It's going to be a bruise that she'll have to ice up. But you know what? That was a great way to start for South Carolina because, as we just mentioned, they're going to have their hands full against Linestock here today. She's got a ton of movement on that drop ball. She'll throw it in the low 60s, so not a ton of velocity. But because she doesn't throw it extremely hard, it gives it more time to drop off the table. She's got a changeup, too, that she's going to throw in any count. But it's really that drop ball that she'll throw to both sides, especially inside to the right-handed batters, has a little extra run low and inside. Here's Denver Bryant. <laughs> Fouls it off for strike one. And those are key pieces of the offense, too. When you do have an opportunity to play some small ball, to put down a sacrifice bunt, you have to try to execute. Do your job at the plate. Move that runner over into scoring position. Just do whatever you can to get that ball down in fair territory. Bryant pulls the bat back, takes the ball. It's 1-1. Denver 1-7 for seven in the Mississippi State Series. She was 2-3 for three in the midweek against Clemson. That was a 7-0 loss to the 19th ranked Tigers here for Carolina. Team they had defeated in a wild game at Clemson earlier this year. This could come back into play. You gotta keep your eye on it. It does drop foul, but that's how hard the wind's blowing. Everything that you would expect to be routine is no longer routine with the way that the wind is blowing all over the place. I, I would think too, you played shortstop. It's Tons of communication, more communication that you would normally use from that position just to try to keep everybody on the same page and safe because there's going to be a ball that starts out in center field that's going to end up in left field. These are one of those days where in your regular warm-ups before the game, you throw the ball up as high as you possibly can and just to see where it's going to land to give you an idea of just how far that ball's going to travel with the win. Called strike three. Linestock took something off it. Bryant strikes out, one away here in the first. Great looking change up here. Linestock just pulls the string, gets Denver Bryant thinking she's going to come back with the drop ball. You can see just how early Denver Bryant starts her swing. She tries to hold up, but that thing's a strike all day long. Here's Zoe Leno, who takes ball one. Leno has been good. Last six games, seven of her last 19 at the plate was three for nine in the Mississippi State Series. So she's in that three spot. And a ground ball to short. Charging it, throwing on the run, not in time. Leno beats it out. Spencer Priggy at shortstop had taken a step towards second base, and then she had to adjust back, and by that time it was too late to get the out, two on with one down. And that's all a product of Riley Blampede's at bat to lead off the game, just getting on first base because you're exactly right, Eric. Because she was over at first base, Spencer Priggy took an extra step towards second base to try to cover two and then tried to recover and sprint towards the pitcher's circle, make a play on that one, but nice job by Zoe Leno to go ahead and run hard out of the box to beat that one out. The first hit of the game belongs to South Carolina, and here's Jen Cummings. Cummings at 218 on the season with a couple of home runs. One on one. Line stock, the Southern Miss transfer, 13 wins a season ago. That Southern Miss had 185 strikeouts. I know you took note of a quote that Courtney Diefel told us about Morgan Linestock, tremendous human and teammates. I don't know if you can have higher praise from a coach than hearing something like that. Well, especially when you see what she's able to do out there in the circle. This is going to head out of play. And it's two and two. She just has this fiery competitiveness about her when she's out there, too, and a confidence that I think exudes across the rest of not just the infield, but the entire team when she's out there pitching. Love to see that 
a pitcher is fully invested in the pitches that they're throwing, confident that they're able to get everybody out. Slap the other way, and giving chase is Hannah Gamble, but running out of room, we'll do the 2-2 again. Linestock SEC Pitcher of the Week. She can get fired up in the circle. Would be pretty pumped up with a strikeout right now. Two on and one down for South Carolina. Slow roller will go foul. And Linestock's had great weekends the past two weekends, not just against Missouri, yes. but also against Georgia. The Georgia Bulldogs, a very good drop ball hitting team, and I thought she threw some exceptional pitches against them. You see her numbers against Mizzou. That was a series win for Arkansas, and they had that series win, taking two out of three in Athens against Georgia. This has a ton of English on it, and it's foul ball. Smart play by Hannah Gamble. I thought for a second that that ball was going to roll even further foul, but it almost looked like it was about to cut back into fair territory as she went to field that one. Another long at bat, a good battle here by Jen Cummings. You can see she's just way out in front on some of these swings, inching further and further towards the front of that batter's box. Eighth pitch of this at bat will need a ninth. So we've had a couple of really good long at bats for Carolina so far. Blampede and now Cummings here in the first inning. And already Linestock throwing 27 pitches here in the bottom half of the first. Cummings started this at bat just a little bit further back in the box, but look at how far up she's crept as this at bat has gone on. This one is hit out to left field. Reagan Kramer under it. She's got it, no problem with that. Two down. Looks like South Carolina trying to take away some of that movement early on the drop ball from Linestock and possibly even make her feel uncomfortable in the circle by moving around in that batter's box. The further up in the box you are, typically as a drop ball pitcher, you almost want to get that pitch to break sooner than you would if a batter was all the way in the back of the box. Kiana Jones takes ball one. As a hitter, though, if you move up in the box, how does that throw off your timing and what you're accustomed to? It can affect it a little bit, but that's where practicing that during the week, especially if you've got a drop ball pitcher on your staff, getting used to being up in the box can try to give you a bit of an advantage because she's going to throw it in the low 60s like we talked about, so it's not going to be overwhelming velocity, but because it's down in the lower part of the velocity, you're going to get an increase in movement, especially down in the zone. And everybody's going to have a little bit of a different strategy. Right, Deanna Jones all the way in the back of the yeah, box. Yeah, exactly, Maddie. There it is. Swings at the 2-0, sends it to left field. Get down for a base hit. Blampede around the score, and South Carolina is on the board here in the first. RBI number 19 on the season for Kiana Jones. Well, it all starts, as you mentioned, with that great at-bat for Blampede. Hit by pitch, gets on, and then she comes around to score here in the first. Great swing by Kiana Jones here, too, just getting barrel underneath this pitch and the long extension able to drop it out into left field. But great at-bat after great at-bat in this inning. Even if you don't get the end result, still making line stock work early in this game is going to be huge for South Carolina. Time called here by Courtney Diefel, who handles the pitching staff for her. It comes to the pitching going up against these batters. The 1 0 pitch to Black. 1 0 1. Nia, 255 on the season with three home runs. Second year with South Carolina after starting her career with the Georgia Bulldogs. The 1 1. Another one fouled off the plate, 1 and 2. Second hit batter of the inning and getting a big brunt to that was our plate umpire, Jose Shaparo. I think he meant it. 
It sounded like it might have ricocheted off of. Oh, look, we have a new batter, Bree Warren. <laughs> Bases loaded with two down. Strike one. A little disappointed in the lack of analysis from Madison Shipman, but I'm going to let it go this time. I'm just glad he's back there, back <laughs> behind the plate. The squiver, this is trouble. Priggy with the charge, throws on the run, made it look easy. Good play. And South Carolina leaves the bases loaded. Three pitches. Hannah Gamble leads things off for Arkansas here in the top half of the second inning. Gamble, Halverson, and Carter to face Vauder, working with a one-run lead. 2-0 to Gamble. 229 on the season. Still has the power though. 10 home runs. Giving her 43 for her career. Seven shy of Lenny Malkin's program record. There's the strike. Two and two. You know, Eric, every time we come into a game, I always like to think about the competition within the game. In my mind, when I saw this matchup, I was thinking about the drop ball matchup that we're getting in this ball game between the two pitchers. It's almost like a battle of the drop balls with Vodder and Linestock. Both of them throwing the same pitch, but in, in different ways. Vodder's got a bit more velocity on her drop ball, so it's not going to drop and have as much depth as Linestock's does because she's thrown it in the low 60s versus the high 60s. This is for ball four, and Gamble's aboard to start things here in the second for the Razorbacks. But both of them with really tall frames out there in the circle, so that adds to the bit of deception that they have on their pitches, and I just think it's such a fun battle within this ball game between these two programs, both of them being so successful, throwing similar pitches just in different ways. And of course, both of them being transfers over to the SEC. Butter will work against Kylie Halverson. This is shot to right center field. It gets down, it gets all the way to the wall. Gamble being held at third. It's a double for Halverson, and Arkansas is in business with nobody out here in the second. You could just hear that one off of the bat. Kylie Halverson got every bit of this pitch. Looked like a drop ball that was low and outside. And Halverson with her swing, she gets great extension. Look at the way that she lets go with the bat. She's so good at driving the ball the opposite way, using that back leg to drive it out into right center. That's exactly how you want to attack a pitch that's going down in the zone. Almost try to get behind it, get underneath it, so that you can still get that power behind your swing. Alverson with her team best ninth double of the season. There's strike one to Nia Carter. Alverson had a good series against Mizzou, was four for seven at the plate with a home run and four runs batted in. She's had a double in each of the last three games. One on one. And the home run you mentioned, she went back to back with Nia Carter in that ball game too. Both of them hitting home runs. Nia Carter's first career home run as she launched out of the park to right field. Carter goes the opposite way. That gets down for a base hit. One run is in, a second run will score as it's bobbled in left field by Warren and sliding in the second is Carter. 2-1 Arkansas. Another really nice piece of hitting by Arkansas against this drop ball. This one coming from the left side for Nia Carter, driving it the opposite direction. Two runners in scoring position, doesn't try to do too much, just drops this thing right out into left field, shortens up her stride and bounces in front of Bree Warren. It almost took a mid hop on her, skipped away, and that's what allowed Kylie Halverson to score all the way from second base on that bobble out and left. So it scored a hit and an error, and Arkansas has a 2-1 lead, and here's Ryland Hedgecock. Grounded to short, 
Carter looked back to second, the throw on the first. One away. And that's where Elena Botter needs to get back to, trying to induce those ground ball outs. A couple of those drop balls were good pitches, but just not quite low enough in the zone, especially going up against an offense who does an extremely good job of hitting right-handed pitching drop balls. Looking statistically, they lead the SEC in OPS hitting against drop balls this season. I actually found that kind of surprising because off the top of my head, I would have just assumed that it was gonna be the Georgia Bulldogs that would lead in OPS against drop balls just because they have so many batters in their offense that seem to be tailor-made to hit a drop ball. But the Arkansas Razorbacks led the SEC in OPS. And of course, Georgia right behind them in the number two spot. And who leads the country? The Oklahoma Sooners. That's usually the answer yes, you can throw out Yes, there. especially <laughs> offensively. Alyssa Brito does a great job getting her barrel underneath drop balls over there along with, it seems like, pretty much everybody in that Sooners lineup. 101 the count to Spencer Priggy. Now you talked about Vauder, that drop, but she did in that Mississippi State game, the win for South Carolina to close out that series, mixed in quite a few change-ups in that game. Yeah, the changeup's a big piece too, especially if you notice that an offense is going up there sitting the drop ball. She can throw that changeup in any count. It's a pitch that she has a ton of confidence in. Lifted to right, but now blowing over to center, and that means Riley Blampede's got to make a play on it. Two that, down. That swing right there was an example of what the changeup can do because you're gearing up for that high velocity drop ball. And by the time you recognize that it's a changeup out of her hand, it's too late. So you just try to follow through with your swing, see if you can try to dump something out into the outfield. But that's another weapon that Vodder's going to have to use against this lineup. Back to the top of the order, and here's Reagan Johnson, who grounded to first. And Anaya Black her first time. Johnson with 53 hits, which is second in the conference. Come on, Blue, stop sleeping. Had 79 hits a season ago as a freshman. Started each game in center field for the Razorbacks. Shows bunts, misses for a ball. Johnson's really just the, the model of consistency up at the top of the lineup for Arkansas, setting the table for all the powerful hitters that they have in their offense. Finished last season, batting well over 370. Slapped foul, and it's two and two. And the key to being a successful slapper, especially with as much film and scouting that there is out there, is being able to read the defense and read what the pitcher is trying to do to you in game and even within and at bat. You can see how the whole left side of the infield, Brooke Blankenship playing up in front of that base path between second and third base. And using the ground to your advantage too. That's one of the benefits of a slapper going up against a drop ball pitcher is that ball's already going down in the zone. So you can almost miss hit it straight down into the ground, try to get that high hop and beat something out in the infield. Vauder, 21 wins with the Cardinal last year. 12 and six for the game clock. Gamecocks here this year, that's fouled off. Another 2-2. This one's hit well to right center field and moving over and making a spectacular catch is Riley Blampede. On Sunday, capping off an undefeated season. You know, Eric, I'm still hurting from that Camilla Cardozo 
three that she hit against the Tennessee Lady Volunteers a few weeks ago. Still, this is just still a reminder. Back my mind. That's right. This is just a reminder for those who don't know. Madison is a proud Tennessee alum. I know that a lot's happened between <laughs> now and but then, but you, let me remind still everybody. Still fresh. Maddie's memory. <laughs> she never forgets. <laughs> she never forgets. <laughs> just fantastic run through the season and the tournament for Dawn Staley and her team. Dawn, um, I believe she's in Europe. <laughs> she's a season ticket holder here. I think we may see her here tomorrow. I hope so, because they have a parade through town here to celebrate their third championship on Sunday. Grounded to short. Backhander to Priggy. She can't handle it. And it's going to be a base hit for the pitcher, Vauder, to start things out here in the second. Now there was basketball news for Arkansas because they rolled out the video welcome mat for the new head basketball coach for the men's program in Fayetteville, John Calipari taking over. So softball team sending out their welcome just across the parking lot from Bud Walton Arena. He's taken, what, three different programs to the postseason between UMass, Memphis, and Kentucky, right? Did you drop in a little minute, man? I got to keep up with you, Eric. That's what it comes down to. I if uh, I know Coach Cal's got a lot going on because if you saw his press conference, he said he you know had a Metis team and there is no team. I do have eligibility <laughs> remaining. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a vertical leap. <laughs> <laughs> Ellis fields the bunt, the sacrifice successful. The number nine hitter, Blankenship, moves over Vauder, one down here in the second. But exciting basketball times in Fayetteville and also here, of course, in Columbia. I am very impressed that you would know the Calipari. I try to keep you on your toes. Yeah, that's, oh, that's, well, that's <laughs> what's on my toes with you. <laughs> Top of the order, Blampede had that 12 pitch at bat. It was hit by a pitch and scored the Carolina run last inning. And that great defensive play that mm. she just and made to end the top of the second inning. You hope that maybe you can carry some of that momentum from defense over onto the offensive side. This one is hit deep to left field. It is gone. Fourth home run of the season for Riley Blampede. Run prevention, run production. She does it all. Carolina in front. And this energy and the quality at bats that you're seeing from South Carolina early in this game are all a byproduct of the first at bat that Riley Blampede had against Linestock. She saw so many pitches, she fouled off literally everything that Linestock throws. She gets another drop ball, this one a little bit further up in the zone, but I love the way that she drops her barrel almost behind her to get underneath that pitch and drive it out on a line out to left field to give the Gamecocks the lead. She knew it was gone. Wind blowing out to left was just going to help matters. There's ball one to Denver Bryant. And the feeling you must have when one step out of the box, you know that it's gone, it has to be one of the best feelings in softball. And she squared that one up so well, yes. she did not need any of the wind. That thing was going out no matter what. But especially with the way that South Carolina has just been struggling to find that consistent piece of offense, having somebody like Riley Blampede up in that leadoff spot who's got a lot of experience for South Carolina, having her be able to step up and come through with quality at bats, that's exactly what this team needs. Grounded to Priggy at short over to first, and Brian is retired, two down. It was Elena Vodder that got things started in this inning, too, with that hard shot over to Spencer Priggy at shortstop. I'll bring up Zoe Leno, reached on an infield single her first time. Ball one. Well, Morgan Linestock came into play today with a sub two earn run average, 179. And opponents hitting 204 against her. And 
South Carolina has put three on the board through the first two innings. And it's the at-bats and the swings that they're having against her too, top to bottom. Maybe not everybody's getting a hit, but it just feels like they're working on getting their timing down on that drop ball specifically. We'll call up in the zone there, but I feel like she's going to have to go to that changeup a little bit more than what we've seen the first time through the order. Because that seems like the pitch that they're going after, trying to get underneath that drop ball, try to lift it out to the grass. And that's what gave them the lead. Three and one. There's another changeup. And the other part of this, too, is that she hasn't been able to throw that pitch consistently for a strike yet. I know it's still early in this ball game. It feels like a lot of things have happened, and it's just the bottom of the second inning. But trying to find that consistency, being able to locate that changeup for a strike. Fouled off. Now, Leinstock's thrown 54 pitches so far, and it just feels like the command's not exactly where she wants it to be. The score would tell you that as well with the South Carolina team that has struggled to score with three on the board against Courtney Diefel's team so far. And I think it's just the amount of foul balls, too, because Coach Courtney Diefel said that she can tell that Leinstock's at her sharpest with the amount of break and spin on the drop ball. We just have not seen it as sharp as we've seen it as of late for Leinstock. Leno walks with two down here in the second. Here comes Courtney Diefel. I wonder. Look from what South Carolina saw in line stock, and that is Robin Heron, of course, coming from the left side. She's going to bring the velocity up just a little bit, throws it in the mid-60s. But you can see right there, that's a prime example of what you're going to see from Robin Heron. She's going to primarily work up in the zone, a lot of upspin on her pitches. She does have a changeup that she's going to use consistently in there as well. But just trying to see if South Carolina is going to be able to make that adjustment from drop balls to rise balls quickly in this ball game. There goes the runner, and stealing second easily is Leno. 44th stolen base of the season for South Carolina. And Le Leno with her third. And throw it low to mid 60s, up in the zone again with that rise ball. Lots of change ups, too. You can see already by the swings, South Carolina going to have to make adjustments quickly. Both of the swings that Jen Cummings has taken off of Heron in this at bat. She swung underneath both pitches. Cummings flight out to left her first time. That's fouled off and out of play. Aaron coming back from injury returned against Georgia on April 1st. Courtney Diefel stressed is more of a preventative being very conservative measure than anything else, just resting the arm. Two and two. Courtney Diefel wondering if it's off the plates. You can see she's old school without the electronic communication with Pitchcom. We'll signal in the pitches. Gets away and taking third base easily is Leno. A couple of defensive miscues already because even when Zoe Leno took off to second base, it almost looked like the defense wasn't quite ready for her yes. to steal second. Just a delayed throw down to two, and then that ball just gets away from Miller back behind the plate to allow Leno to reach easily over at third base. Yes, Scored a pass ball to Kennedy Miller. Fly ball, the wind will send this into the stands. Or at least the top of the dugout, then the stands. Going on to the ninth pitch of this at bat, too. Similar start to Robin Heron's appearance in this ball game as Morgan Leinstock's greeting with the first at bat that went, what, 12 pitches to Riley Blampede? It did. Ball four. Cummings works a walk. Runners on the corners with two down here in the second. Let's go! 
Looked like Heron tried to go to a drop ball there just to mix things up a bit with that full count and missed low in the zone. Now big opportunity for Kiana Jones who got the base hit in the first inning off of line stock, but again, a completely different look, different pitcher in the circle, and also first and third situation on the base paths. Fouled off by Jones. Jones, as Maddie mentioned earlier, the home run leader for this South Carolina team with five on the season. Just 21 on the season for South Carolina, adding to their total here in this inning on the two-run shot by Blampede. Jones down the count, 0-2. Oh down low blocked by Miller. That means Cummings has to stay at first. The one-two pitch from Heron. This is up in the air. Under it is Kramer now drifting over and putting it away to retire the side. But not season intensity vibe. Couple of extra inning games and Florida played in that series on Monday and then bounced back and losing the USF after that. Their pitchers having to throw a lot of innings between Keegan Rothrock and Ava Brown pretty much going back and forth between those two pitchers. Those midweeks start to get tough as you get down the stretch of SEC play when you're just pretty much going back and forth between two and, and two freshmen at that. Kramer, Ellis, and Miller for Arkansas here in the third. Kramer struck out in the first. Down the count, 0-2. Oh 1-2. Big inning for Elena Vauder here, too, after her team just got her up by one run in the bottom of the second inning. You want to come out and try to get three straight outs. Keep that momentum in your dugout for as long as possible. One-two pitch to Kramer. Two and two. Fly ball to shallow left. Bree Warren comes on. One away. The one pitch I'll be curious to see if Elena Vodder uses as we get deeper into this ball game is the rise ball. She will throw that pitch every once in a while. And just to give you a different look from what you see from the drop ball and from the change at both which work more down in the zone, she will occasionally throw that rise ball. And especially with the wind, too, it's going to be hard to drive it out to right field. Here's Bree Ellis. Ellis walked in the first. Ellis obviously has great power. 14 home runs last year for Auburn as a sophomore, and she's got 13 this year, but one of her goals, according to Courtney Dyfel, coming to Arkansas was to become a more complete hitter, not just known for hitting home runs. I think it's worked out pretty well. Really tried to shore up some of the holes that she had in her swing. And one of the first things that I noticed, too, was that her swing looked a lot quieter and a lot smoother. And I think it really starts from where she places her feet when she gets into the box. When you look at her swings from the previous two seasons, she had a really open stance. And now that left foot, that front foot is a lot more closed allowing her front shoulder to stay closed. And what that does is it allows her to have more plate coverage on the outside part of the plate. Majority of her swings and misses, when you look back at the previous two seasons, a lot of them were low and away because she couldn't get to that side of the plate. But now because her stance is a little bit more closed, she's actually got a lot of powerful numbers on those outside pitches. And reaching base at a higher clip than before. Showing that eye, but he also saw how her batting average is up almost 100 points compared to a season ago. 
and she's going to take the walks. If they're not going to throw her anything good to hit, she'll go ahead and take her base. But what that does is it puts a lot of pressure on the batter that's behind her. And of course, that's a freshman in Kennedy Miller. And we've seen the numbers that Kennedy's been able to put, put up so far this season. But now you're getting into the part of SEC play where people are circling Brie Ellis, wanting to stay away from her. Fouled off by Miller. Ellis came into the game with an on-base percentage of 462. That's best on the team. So she'll add to it with a couple of walks tonight. I'd say she's pretty do doing pretty good with that uh, 462 on-base percentage. Some clutch hits, too, for Bree. That three-run home run against Georgia to give Arkansas the win. That was a strike. It's 0-2. She's hit some monster home runs for them, too, not just home runs that are barely leaving the park, but ones that roll well out into that parking lot beyond left field hmm. down in Fayetteville. 0-2 the count to Miller. Grounded to short her first time. like how uh, Courtney Dyfel knows, you know, she's the third base coach, but the third base coach's box is just a rumor to her right now because <laughs> there she is taking cover because you go from Ellis to Miller to Gamble, they can pull the ball a little bit, so. A lot of righties <laughs> right in a row there. <laughs> Not Courtney's first rodeo to be able to take cover. In on the hands, this is gonna be trouble. Bryant with the charge and the throw and it gets away. Look like Black had it. It'll be a runner on first and a runner on third for Arkansas after the error for South Carolina. Briellis doesn't look too comfortable down at third. This throw looked like it was on line from Denver Bryant over to Anaya Black at first base. She fields it in plenty of time, throws it on the run, and it looks like it just misses out of her glove. Tips off at the end of the glove. That's a that's a throw that needs to be caught. So here is the dangerous Hannah Gamble. Swings at the first pitch and fouls it off. Two. So a couple of errors so far for South Carolina. Six, four, three charts had Carolina fourth in Division One in defensive run save. So Elena Vauder gonna have to go to work here and try to work out of this jam with runners on the corners and one out. And when you have a pitcher like Vonder in the circle too, you know you're going to get a lot of ground balls behind you. So you've got to make sure that you're fielding as many of those ground balls as cleanly as possible. Now she can rack up the strikeout numbers, but she, when she's pitching her best, she's getting a ton of those ground ball outs. So she needs to rely on her defense behind her to make those plays. And this is where as a pitcher, you can't try to overthrow. Can't try to overthrow, can't try to go for the strikeout. Just go with that drop ball, that nice moving pitch, both sides of the plate. You can see where their pitching ranks as far as ground outs per game, over eight and a half ground outs per game, leading the SEC. Got to make that defense work. Two and two. This is hooking foul. We'll do the 2-2 again.
Gamble's last home run was April 1st at Georgia. Hit two home runs in that game. This one is lifted up right side of the infield. Second baseman moves out, has to fight the win. Tagging up at third, coming to the plate and scoring. Heads up play by Ellis to tie the game at three. We talked about the wind blowing from right towards left, and that just really made Emma Sellers work for it. She went down to the turf. Ellis saw that. That's all she needed. The Sellers broke back towards right field on her left side and then had to recover going back towards center field because just how much this fly ball was moving wasn't hit deep out into right field. Good recovery there with the dive, but because she had to lay out, because she had to get on the grass, that's what allowed Brie Ellis to tag up and score on that shallow pop fly. Really heads up base running by Ellis. Alverson doubled and scored in the second. So it'll be the rare sack four, <laughs> sacrifice fly to second. <laughs> you don't see that very often, but with this win. <laughs> RBI for Hannah Gamble, number 30 on the season for the senior. Miller at first, the 0-2 pitch. This is for ball one. And typically on those fly balls, you'd hope that your right fielder would be able to get underneath it because they've got all the momentum with the throw, but I think because of the power that Arkansas has, you're seeing this outfield play a few steps deeper than maybe they normally would with a drop ball pitcher in the circle. You can see Keanu Jones just a couple of steps back from where the dirt patch is and right. Ground ball to second, Sellers on to Black. Ready for the home half of the third here at South Carolina. <laughs> Nia Black to lead things off here for the Gamecocks. Black was hit by a pitch in the first. One of two hit batters by Morgan Leinstock, Robin Heron on in relief. 0-2. The 0-2 from Heron. Up high, 1-2. Count evens up at two and two. I felt as I've watched this Arkansas team throughout this season, it seems like they're really starting to fire on all cylinders as we get to the halfway point in SEC play. And we got a chance to talk to Coach Courtney Dyfel about what she's seen from this team this year. And she felt that maybe in the middle, not finding as much consistency, a big part of that was probably because Robin Heron was dealing with that injury, wasn't in the pitching rotation consistently for them. So she felt that getting her back into the pitching rotation was going to be a huge boost for them moving forward. Heron gets the strikeout one away here in the third. And you can see exactly why, because she throws so completely different from what you see from Morgan Linestock. She's coming from the left side. She's got some pretty good velocity on it, and she's going to work up in the zone. And she's the most effective when she's able to get ahead in the count. Getting ahead 0-2 allows her to play with pitches outside of the zone, and that's when you get big swings and misses like that. Ball one to Bree Warren. Aaron last year as a freshman made 24 appearances through more than 70 innings, 73 in fact. Had an earned run average just above two, so she's got a lot of experience. And as Maddie mentioned, missed a few weeks this season just to make sure everything was working properly and getting her ready for the home stretch of the regular season and get set for the SEC tournament at Auburn. Two and one to Warren. Warren, a big hit in that win against Mississippi State last series for South Carolina. Two-run double. Added a hit against Clemson in the midweek this past week. 
Heading the count three and one against Heron. Count goes full. Big smile on Heron's face after that swing and miss. A bit of a hesitant swing from Bree Warren. I almost looked like maybe she tried to stop her swing, knowing that that pitch was going to be way up and out of the zone. Surprise coach, coach Deifel didn't go back up and inside after that swing before, but it is interesting that Arkansas is one of the few teams, really the only team that I can think of off the top of my head that's not using the electronic pitch communication that's new to softball this season. Swung on and a fly ball to right. Can be an adventure. Carter comes in, but it doesn't look like it's a problem for Halverson who puts it away for out number two. Courtney looks young. But she's old school when it comes to calling pitches. <laughs> That's what I'm going with here. And see, the armbands to me are still kind of new because we never used the armband for calling pitch signals. It just went straight from the coach in the dugout to the catcher, and the catcher would feed the signs to the pitcher and the rest of the infield. That's so really old school. Courtney's right there. old school, and you are older school. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But she said they haven't had a problem, an issue with that. That pitch clock, getting pitches in in time, she said they like to keep the game moving. It helps their pitchers when there's not as much time in between pitches. They just like to work at that quick pace. Swing and a miss, one one to Vauder. Courtney, of course, was a defensive catcher in her playing days and has called the pitches and worked with the pitching staff for a long time, and I've always thought that. Swing and a miss just to put the pitchers in the mindset of you're the one in control of each at bat. You're the in control of the game. And the best way to do that is just to keep the tempo up, make the hitter step out, call time, which you can't do all the time anymore. <laughs> Swung on and missed. Good inning for Heron. Gets a couple of strikes. Let's spend a couple of minutes with Courtney Diefold, the Arkansas head coach. I'm glad to see you haven't blown away yet. Oh, my gosh. There, <laughs> how bad is it <laughs> down there? Give me a run for my money, though. It is very gusty. Um, so it seems like it's calming down, but it's it's pretty strong out there. You can see it's kind of changed the game a little bit. So, In coach, Linestock got the start in this game, bringing in Robin Heron very quickly. Already a couple of strikeouts. What do you like that's working for her today? Well, she's trusting her spin, and she's attacking the zone. So she's trusting the plan, and uh, she looks really good. Thank you, coach. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll pick. All right, full disclosure here. Everyone heard Courtney perfectly fine except me. I had just a little thing going on here. <laughs> did, did she say anything that I should have? Did she have some witty comment that I didn't laugh at that I should have? Because I feel terrible if I, I – I'll hear about it tomorrow morning if she I don't She was giving laugh you at. a full weather report about what the wind is feeling like That's down what I on wanted. the field right Good. now. It's Meteorologist very Courtney you, Diefel yes, checking yes, in. Perfect. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And then just talking about Robin here and how she's been trusting Thank her stuff you. when she gets in there. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you right here. And she looks really good already. Eight swings and misses in just the five batters that she's faced in this ball game, and it's because she's getting ahead early in the count. But a foul by Nia Carter leaving things off here for Arkansas. I would have felt terrible if Courtney made some joke that I didn't even laugh at because I couldn't. I, I was reading her lips, and I'm like, wait, I'm not hearing her, but you were, so that's great, and everybody else was. It's just a me thing, but I just – Wanted to make sure. Not this time around. I'll make sure to, <laughs> to give you a hard time tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, Now I can sense you missed a great opportunity just to have fun with I me. I really yes. did, yep. Carter singled in a run in the second as we play here in the fourth. The 1-1 one -one from Botter. Good example of the rise ball that you'll see from Vodder throw every once in a while. And I think, again, that's a pitch that she's going to have to throw more often against Arkansas in this ball game. Foul tip into the glove for strike two. Two and two now to Carter. Especially if she can locate it for strikes at the top part of the zone, make it another pitch that they have to think about when they step into the box. So that they can't go up there and just sit on that drop ball on either side of the plate. But they're going to have to decide, do they want to go after a rise? Do they want to go after the drop? And even sneak some of those change-ups in there. Yeah. 
even by some of these takes too that Nia Carter's taken up in the box. You can tell that she's seen the ball extremely well coming out of Otter's hand. Slapped out to left. Warren has it. One down here in the fourth for Arkansas. Another quality at bat for Arkansas. Carter just getting underneath that one. Hit it straight to Bree Warren. And you could tell even a little bit after that changeup was thrown for a ball to bring the count to full. Botter just not liking how she's not as consistent with that off-speed pitch today. That's typically a pitch that she can throw for a strike in any count. Starts with strike one to Hedgecock. Hedgecock grounded to short her first time. <laughs> oh and two. Just missed, it's one and two. The appeal, and she checked her swing. There's that change of just missing outside, but you could tell by the take from Hedgecock that she had to think about swinging at that pitch just because of how close it was to the strike zone. That's the area that you want to throw in when you get ahead 0-2. Goes right, right back to that same spot, and as a batter, you feel like you've got to swing at it. You don't want to leave it into the hands of the umpire when they're that close on that outside edge. Another one, two, to Hedgecock. Rounded to shorts. Blankenship to first, two down. Always enjoy watching the different shortstops that play in SEC, Brooke Blankenship with that signature low arm angle that she throws th from from shortstop. It allows her to have a lot of range and be able to throw the ball from a bunch of different arm slots. At times it almost looks like her hand scraping the dirt with as low as she gets with that arm angle. You would drop down your arm angle. Absolutely, yes. If you needed to get a little extra velocity on it, you'd set your feet, you'd come over the top. <laughs> Only deep into the 5-6 hole when I had a little bit more time to throw it across the diamond. Ground ball to second. That's Sellers, and it's a 1-2-3. Let's just start with your very first batter in the lineup, Riley Blampeach. He has a 12-pitch at back. It's hit by pitch. Kind of set the tone for you guys here today and how you're going to approach Arkansas, didn't it? Yeah, I think uh, I think that was a great at bat. We got to see a lot of pitches in, in, uh, in her first swing, and then... Uh, certainly you saw what she did on the second ball. She got all of that. And I wanted to touch on Elena Botter too in the circle. She gave up a couple of those runs in the second inning. Seemed like she was starting to settle in back in the fourth. What's the difference that you've seen from her in the beginning of the game till now? Well, I think she's getting ahead. Um, she's doing a good job getting ahead of hitters. Uh, and I think she's mixing speeds well. And the hat is a great fashion choice on a windy night, Beth. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Hold on to it tight. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Coach Smith came prepared for the hat. Maybe we need to get a couple of hats up here in the booth to, to keep our hair contained as this game goes on. The wind is still whipping pretty violently out there in center field. Oh, now she's got the uh, she's got the vest. She's, she's got it layer, going on. It's layering it. time. Yep, sun's going down. Temps dropping to 65, dropping down lower 60s today. Not her first April game here in Columbia. 9-1-2 and two for Carolina. Blanket chip to lead off. Four in a row retired by Heron. All right, we got some blanketing going on. Couple tropical blankets tropical blanketing, shot. yep. Oh, and a, that's a good look. Really, One and two. Really good looking curveball that She's throwing outside to the right-handed batters. When she's able to mix that pitch in with the rise ball up in the zone, makes it really difficult to get consistently solid barrel on both of those pitches. Swung on and missed. Heron gets her third strikeout, one away. 
And when it's working, you just keep on pounding the outside part of the plate to these right-handed batters. Such an efficient at bat here for Robin Heron, just working up in the zone, down in the zone with the curveball. Once she got ahead, that's when she started to expand the zone a bit more. Another big swing and miss for Robin Heron. Five in a row retired by the Arkansas reliever. Foul tip, that caught a good piece of Kennedy Miller. Looks like she's got a smile on her face, trying to walk that one off a bit. This is the, the reminder that this is why Maddie was a shortstop and not a catcher. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it is not an easy job back there, having to manage a bunch of different arms in the circle, especially with the way that the game has shifted, moving past just throwing out one or two pitchers throughout an entire season, but going to an entire staff of pitchers, drop balls, rise balls, change ups, curve balls. These catchers have a tough job back there behind the plate. 0-2 oh, the count to Blampede. You throw in the occasional foul ball, too. That makes it even more difficult. Yep. More than occasional for some catchers <laughs> that we've seen over the last <laughs> few games. Blampede, a couple of runs scored, hit by a pitch and scored in the first. We just talked to Bev Smith about that and hit the two-run home run in the second or fourth home run of the season. That came against Morgan Leinstock, who with the first inning in two-thirds gave up four hits, the three runs, the one walk, and a couple of strikeouts. Heron has done an outstanding job coming in in relief. Bounces that one up there. It's two and two. Three and two. I must say, the wind, as the sun goes down, the wind has been dying down a little bit. It's still blowing, but it is not gusting nearly as strong as before. This one is back to Ellis in foul ground, reaches up and grabs it. Two down. I think our sign that the wind might be slowing down a little bit is that that ball did end up staying in foul territory rather than moving over into fair territory because we've already seen a couple of crazy fly balls go up into the air in this ball game. That's one tell. The other tell is our center field camera is a little bit more stable <laughs> instead of getting blown around by a 40 mile per hour gust. That's a nice steady shot right there. Strike one to Denver Bryant. Bryant struck out in the first, grounded out in the second. The 0 1. 0 and 2. So far, to all the righties in the South Carolina lineup, Robin Heron staying pretty much on the outside part of the plate, mixing the curveball and the rise ball, but just staying outside, staying away from those barrels, and they keep chasing at him outside of the zone. The 0 2. Seen a couple of change-ups out of her hand in this inning, too. Threw one in the dirt to Blampede, the at-bat before, and another one, another one there, excuse me. Trying to see if she can locate that pitch in there. Just another element that these Gamecocks are going to have to deal with. Line drive to right, hit well, and it's over the head of the right fielder. Carter back to the wall to get it. Bryant around second, thinking about third. Slams on the brakes and gets back just in time. Safe with a two-out double. Riggy was there if Bryant didn't <laughs> slam on the brakes and get back to the bag in time. Really nice piece of hitting by Denver Bryant, just noting that Heron was staying outside, so she goes with this pitch. Might have even been called a ball, but it's up in the zone, something that she can get her barrel on and drives it out into that right center gap and heads up base running by Denver Bryant. Rolling on the fields of hell, running safe. <laughs> Denver's like, nice try. <laughs> Giving each other a hard time about it over I there I win that base. battle and you lose a challenge. <laughs> really close play. It was close in real time, but it was even closer looking at it in slow motion. Sharp tag applied by Spencer Priggy. But Denver just barely got that hand back to second base in time. Ball one to Zoe Leno. Infield single in the first, walked in the second. 
was stranded at third each time. Carolina's had their opportunities, put a few more runs on the board. 101. When you look at Zoe Leno's numbers for the season, I really don't think they're a good indication of just how many quality at bats she's had for South Carolina this year, primarily at the beginning of the year, used mostly as a pinch hitter to come in late in the game, but has worked her way into the starting lineup because of the ways that she's been swinging the bat. Even last weekend hit a couple of balls hard, just happened to go straight to outfielders. Clemson game as well, robbed of extra bases in that game. Good defensive play by the Tigers, so. The one two is fouled off. And I also like too that it's an addition of another lefty bat in this lineup for South Carolina. They've got quite a few right-handed bats. Just throwing a lefty in there every once in a while to mix things up, whether it's a lefty or a righty in the circle. I always think it's good to have a good mix of both in your lineup. Swung on and missed. Heron gets the strikeout. That is Carolina have been costly as well. This is the time if you're South or excuse me, if you're Arkansas, you really want to see. That lineup try to come through third time through the order, seeing Elena Vodder again. Try to see if they can come through with some more runs this time around. Johnson, Kramer, and Ellis for Arkansas here in the fifth. Johnson 0 for 2 was robbed of a hit on a great defensive play by Blampede her last time. Tap back to Vauder. The quick flip has to be quick to get the speedy Johnson one away. Vauder almost looked like she fielded that one pretty routinely and looked up and saw just how quickly <laughs> Reagan Johnson was moving down that first baseline. Put a little bit more pep in her step as she flipped that one over to first base. I think she's still laughing about it as she steps onto the rubber. Reagan Kramer 0 for 2, strike one. Six in a row retired by Elena Vauder as she works to Kramer here in the fifth. Went to distance Sunday in the win against Mississippi State. Four hits, just one run. Two and one. Two and two. Gets that drop ball called for a strike on the inside part of the plate. She's thrown two change-ups in this at bat, has missed low with both of them. Swung on, hit well to right field, moving back, getting a good jump on it and hauling it in is Kiana Jones, two down. Seen a couple of hard hit balls off the bat, bats of these Razorback batters throughout this ball game, but nice plays made by the outfielders. That constant communication about where the wind is too, very important as we get deeper into the game. Here's Bree Ellis, has walked twice. Base is empty, we'll see how careful Vauder is with Ellis here with two down in the fifth. I think tie ball game, I'd still stay way on the outside part of the plate either low in the zone, way up in the zone, outside, see if she'll swing at something to get herself out in this at bat. Comes inside, gets the call for strike one. Playing with fire a little bit on that inside part of the plate. Hits a lot of her home runs down that left field line. So much power on pitches inside. If you're gonna throw it there. You better make sure you miss inside. One and two. Goes with an off speed up and outside. We talked to Coach Bev Smith about how she was going to attack Brie Ellis this weekend. And of course, it all 
just depends on the situation. Nobody on here. Ahead one and two. Two and two. There's still that element of, of course, wanting to be careful and trusting that your pitcher can execute her pitches, but this is where all of that experience comes into play for Elena Vodder. All of that World Series experience, postseason experience, not somebody that gets rattled. Fouled off. Now, when we asked about the keys, Bev said, we put a big, I just put a big asterisk next to <laughs> Bree Ellis. And the asterisk means that's code for don't let her beat us. <laughs> There's always the one player on the other team that you just do not want to let them be the ones asterisk, to beat your team. Yeah, asterisk, asterisk worthy. Asterisk worthy, yes. exactly, yes. 2-2. Two, two. Comes inside, it's 3-2. and two. Great take and a great pitch. I love that location. Drop ball low and inside, a little bit of arm side run on it. That's a pitch as a batter. If you swing at it, it's most likely going straight into your left ankle as a right-handed batter. Really tough to lay off of, though. A 3-2. We'll do it again. Great battle between these two players here. See majority drop balls. Does she go to the rise ball here, three and two, see if she can get her chase in? It's a dangerous spot. You better hope that that pitch makes it up and out of the zone because if it sits right over the heart of the plate, Briellis is going to send it over to that track. Called strike three. What a pitch by Vauder. Wins the battle with Ellis to retire the side. Elena Vauder goes back to her bread and butter into this ball game in relief and really settled things down. First batter she faced in release was, relief was Jen Cummings, who walked. This was a pop-up right in front of the plate. Gamble calls for it. And on one pitch, Cummings is retired here in the fifth. And we'll see if South Carolina tries to make an adjustment knowing that Heron continues to get ahead early in the counts. Do they try to be more aggressive early to see if they can jump on something? Ball one. I like that changeup too. Didn't look like Kiana Jones was expecting the changeup there. She's thrown a couple of them. She's missed them way low in the zone. Hasn't gotten one called for a strike yet today. That's a solid single to center field. Moving over to get to it is Johnson. And Jones has her second hit of the ball game. An example of a professional at bat by Kiana Jones, knowing that the changeup was thrown for a ball the pitch before she has not thrown them back to back in this ball game. So she sits something hard, gets a curveball outside, and smokes this thing straight back up the middle. You could hear it right off of the bat. She got it right on the sweet spot. Really good looking swing from Jones. Here's the first at bat for Julia Desiderio, who's in at catcher for South Carolina. Ball one. Junior steps in at 133 on the season. This is a fly ball lifted to the right fielder, Carter, two away. Almost wondering if there was a bit of a hit and run that was put on there with as far off of the first base as Keanu Jones was when that ball was put into play. A bit of a slap swing from Desiderio, showed Bunt pulled back, tried to put it in play. Now bring up Bree Warren, who's 0 for 2, grounded to short in the first, popped out to second in the third. Tried to check her swing. And she did, ball one. Looked like she went. So ball one to Warren. One to one. Warren disagrees with that call. Looked like a backdoor curveball out of the hand of Robin Heron. 
A pitch that she'll start on the inside part of the plate for the left-handed batters. One and two. Goes back to the curveball this time. She just moves it on the outside part of the plate. The one-two from Heron. Base hit to right field. Going from first to third, Carter with a good throw and now slamming on the brakes and getting back safely. Wise decision by Jones. So a base hit for Warren. Good throw by Carter in right field. First and second with two down. Couple of solid line drives off the bats of these Gamecocks in this inning against Robin Heron. Bree Warren out in front just a bit, but Nia Carter, how about that strike throw over to third base? I thought there was going to be no doubt that Keanu Jones was going to end up at third base, but heads up base running with that great throw across the field, kept her at second base. That is the first hit for Bree Warren against the left-handed pitcher this season, so she's aboard at first. Jones at second, and here is Vauder trying to help herself. Oh and two. Seen Botters take some big cuts in this ball game, swinging outside of the strike zone now behind Owen and two. Just trying to hit something on the right side of the infield here. Try to squeak it through the three four hole. Ball one. She's primarily stayed outside to the right handed batters. Really haven't seen her consistently try to run that curveball in on the hands of the righties. Be trying to send something the opposite way. Two and two. Vauder singled and scored in the second, struck out in the third. That strikeout was against Heron. The single was against Linestock. Just got a piece to stay alive. Another 2-2. Two -two. Swung on and missed. Heron gets the strikeout, and South Carolina leaves two on here in the fifth. Absolutely. Jackie Trainer in the circle. Pretty sure she beat us with her pitching in the circle and with the bat a couple of times throughout her career. Caleb Rose we saw in that video. Batted over 500 her freshman season, I believe. Mm-hmm. One on the count to Kennedy Miller, the freshman leading things off for Arkansas here in the sixth in a 3-3 game. Miller 0 for 2, reached on an error her last time. This current edition of the Crimson Tide, they've won three in a row after the Ole Miss sweep. They've got the Saturday, Sunday, Monday schedule. That's fouled off, taking on Texas A&M. So that's 12th ranked A&M against 13th ranked Alabama. A&M third in the SEC standings. They won two of three against Kentucky last weekend. All were one-run games, so some tight battles for the Aggies as they get ready to go to the Rhodes House. And that A&M Bama series should be another good one, too, with Kayla Beaver in the circle for mm -hmm. Alabama, Emily Kennedy in the circle for Texas A&M, and, of course, Kayla Bro on the coaching staff for Alabama this year. Fly ball to center off the bat of Miller. The second baseman goes way out. Sellers to get it, one down. Nine in a row retired by Vauder. You talked about the drop and the change and the curve. It just seems like Vauder's tried to keep the Arkansas hitters a little bit off balance as she goes through the lineup for a third time. 
And I think that's something that you have to do really against any offense, but this offense in particular because they are so good at hitting pitches low in the zone. They are the best in the SEC in terms of OPS when it comes to hitting right-handed drop balls, so I guarantee she knows that coming into this ball game, so you have to be able to go to other pitches to get them out. Gamble with a fly ball deep to left, moving over and running out of room is Bree Warren, and the wind was going to make sure that one was going to go foul. Two and one. And even on some of these foul balls, you can see just how much power this offense has. It looked like Hannah Gamble got that one off of the very last inch of the barrel, and yet somehow it still left the park, of course, in foul territory. But this offense as a whole does a nice job of dropping barrel behind them to get underneath those drop balls. Two and two. But I also like the fact that she's challenging these right-handed batters with the drop ball inside, and that's a pitch that she's able to put a little arm side run on it. So it's working its way in on the hands of the righties, but also down in the zone. Goes outside, misses for ball three. Over the 100 pitch mark here today. Full count. Saw Daniel Gibson in the dugout, the assisting, uh, assistant coaching staff for Courtney Diefel. Some good brain power in there as well. Announced today, picked to the women's national team for this summer. Congratulations to Danielle. Phenomenal lefty bat. Gamble with a fly ball. Blampied has it. For route number two, 10 in a row set down by Vauder. They've got a lot of hitting minds over in that Arkansas dugout, and I guarantee they are strategizing, trying to figure out what's going to be the get best game plan for their offense going up against Elena Vauder. DJ Gasso, a part of the coaching staff, along with Danielle Gibson Wharton this season. Matt Michael, a part of the hitting crew as well more on the analytics side of things, but a bunch of different minds coming together to try to help this offense. Ground ball back up the middle and the base hits. Halverson has her second hit of the night and she's aboard with two down. That ends the streak of 10 in a row retired by Vauder. It's just the third hit of the game for Arkansas against Vauder and their first since the second inning. It was really the walks that seemed to get Vauder into trouble in the early part of this ball game. And Gamble reached via the walk. Of course, Briellis has reached via the walk a couple of times. But back-to-back -back hits after that walk to lead off the second inning is what allowed Arkansas to get two of their three runs. Ground ball, blanket ship, tries to get the force, and it ends up in the outfield. This is going to be a run for Arkansas. Coming around is Halverson. Heading to third is Carter. And Arkansas on top here in the sixth. Breakdown defensively for South Carolina. Tough break on defense for South Carolina, especially for somebody like Brooke Blankenship, who is usually so steady in that shortstop position. This is a prime example of one air leading into another. So she swipes at the ground ball, not able to come up with it cleanly. So she tries to make a throw to second base, and it didn't look like Emma Sellers was prepared for that. And I don't think that throw was going to be there on time either way. But Arkansas able to capitalize and take the lead on a couple of miscues. Four, three Razorbacks. Three make it four errors tonight. Soft liner. Blanket chip gets that one to retire the side, but not before Arkansas. Do you think Coach Taylor is able to keep track of which time zone she's on right now? Wasn't she just in Europe? She was she in, uh, here's what I know. All of a sudden I look up and she's posing for pictures with Serena Williams in <laughs> France. Like, weren't you just in Cleveland winning a national championship? <laughs> Just so impressive to see what that team was able to do and, and for them to be undefeated the entire year. I think even in the softball 
terms of things, looking at what Oklahoma's been able to do the past couple of seasons and seeing the dynasty that they've built, but what Coach Don Staley has done for South Carolina year after year, bringing back another national championship with a completely different team this year than they had last different. year after losing in the Final Four to Iowa. Different starting five, remarkable. To, you know, I, I think you saw it too with Don when the final seconds went off the clock against Iowa. This is squibbed out towards second, thrown on the first. First out here in the sixth inning as Blankenship is retired. Just the tears came right away, and you know that the, just the pressure that Dawn was feeling, and she's someone who doesn't show that too much, just like how the pressure, but I think just trying to answer every single challenge with that bullseye getting bigger and bigger, just that relief and that release right after the game was over, I think told you what you needed to know about the pressure they were feeling to try to win a national championship after being denied last year. Think back to the COVID year. They were undefeated, and then COVID ended everything. That would have been a team that was on the short list to win a national championship, of course. So that confetti shot that you, they just rolled in there, Johnny Hanna, that does not get old. <laughs> just soaking it up. I think while Dawn was at the Final Four, Bev Smith was keeping eyes on Champ. Bev's dog name is Ozzy Smith, I believe, right? Which is, you know, just amazing. <laughs> I believe both dogs made fans. it in the booth last weekend. Though, That's with why Mike I know, Abbott yeah. I call, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no dogs in the booth with us tonight, though. Yet. Yet. <laughs> A little teaser. <laughs> I'm gonna. Where are my Where are my champ treats here? I think champ actually <laughs> champ actually tolerates me at basketball practices. So we've got plenty of room for all the dogs. Got popcorn, cracker jacks, photo ops. Just continue. Fly ball to right. Moving over is Carter. Two down here in the sixth. If you're tuning in for Mississippi State and Ole Miss baseball, we will get you to that showdown, that rivalry game, right when we're done here in Columbia. Until then, you can see the start of that game on the ESPN app. Denver Bryant bats with two outs here in the sixth. Bryant doubled her last time, one for three tonight. Denver had a great swing on a pitch on the outside part of the plate, and we've talked about it throughout this ball game. Robin Heron loves to live outside to the right-handed batters, but with the extension that she got on that pitch, I wouldn't be surprised if she tries to go to something different here. Fly ball to right. Carter is there, and that will do it. One in the bottom of the third inning. Coming into this weekend, of course, I, there's always a couple of series that I circle. And that Tennessee-Mississippi State one was definitely one for me this weekend just because of the way that Mississippi State has been playing this year. Madison Kennedy has been incredible up at the plate. They've gotten some solid pitching in the circle, and I thought it was going to be, great, be a great battle between both of those teams. And to see if Kiki Malloy was going to be back in the lineup for Tennessee. Looks like she was back in the lineup, right back in that leadoff position. Carly Ratcliffe batting for Priggy here in the seventh. Leading things off for Arkansas. Now that Mississippi State team, they can put the runs on the board. Saw that in that Florida series where they scored 24 runs against the Gators. Florida Mizzou series, Florida second place in the SEC. Auburn jumping back into conference play. They'll start a series with LSU tonight. Georgia at Kentucky. Well, we got the 2024 editions of the championship shirts already. Ground ball to Bryant at third. Over to first, one down as Ratcliffe is retired here in the seventh. Courtney Diefel's team was down one nothing after one. They took a 2-1 lead, then they were down 3-2, tied it at three in the third, took the lead in the sixth, and have lost just once when leading after six innings. 
28 and 10 overall in the season, 14th in the latest national rankings, tied for fifth in the SEC standings. Strong RPI of 12 as well, which will come more and more into the conversation as we get closer and closer to May and NCAA tournament time. Hard to believe that May's already right around the corner and we're already having these RPI discussions, strength of schedule discussions. Every coach's strategy nowadays is to try to load up the schedule on the front end. Too soon, did I bring it up too soon? It's not even tax day yet, it's <laughs> April 12th. I feel like it's gonna change quite a bit by the time we get to May. Always a worthy discussion though, and just in how it's shaped how coaches do plan out their schedules moving year to year. I feel like even 10 years ago, you were hunting more wins at the beginning of the season, and now you wanna play the strongest schedule you possibly can. Bryant gets up to rob Johnson of a base hit, two down. Not an easy play for Denver Bryant to make either because she's playing so close to home plate respecting the speed that Reagan Johnson has coming from the left side. This is a sharply hit line drive that Denver has to jump up into the air to snag and robs Johnson of another hit in this ball game. I think Courtney Diefel just uh, gave Denver Bryant her flowers <laughs> on that play. You saw the smile from Denver towards the Arkansas head coach. So Vauder trying to keep it a one-run game and hope her team can come through in the bottom half of the seventh inning. There's the strike, and it's one-on-one one to Kramer. Kramer 0 for 3 against Vauder tonight. And there's that changeup that just seems like it's getting stronger as this game goes on. I'd imagine that one may be a bit too high up in the zone for Vauder's liking, but called a strike nonetheless. Out in front of the plate, it's a fair ball. Well done by Desiderio to get the out. One, two, three inning for Arc. So I guess the, the call on the field is a foul ball. I'm using context clues here. With, but. A, with a one, two count. <laughs> Here's the one, two. Two and two. <laughs> no one reads context clues better than that <laughs> Shipman. So we were in good hands there. Was a bit of a confusing play all the way around. Foul tip. We're hearing the call was upheld, so I guess the call on the field ended up being a foul ball. Yes. Huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> Popped up back behind second, moving out and putting it away is Blanket Ship. All right. Our producer, Scott Epstein. Give me the green light for a commercial, Scott. The green light has been given. Morning, 11.30 Eastern time for game two here on the SEC Network. Robin Heron has been outstanding in relief here tonight for Arkansas. She's been really good about getting ahead in the count. Wouldn't be surprised if she comes back with a strike here after falling behind 1-0. Misses outside with that curveball. She'll mix both sides of the plate to the lefty. She struck Zoe Leno out on a rise ball in her previous at bat and now finds herself behind in the count 2-0. Oh. If I'm Leno, I'm being very aggressive with this swing here. Good take, 3-0. Oh. Have not seen that very often from Robin Heron tonight. Heron came on with two down in the second inning. Has given up three hits, 3-0. There's strike one. Still a good hitter leverage count here, three and one for Zoe Leno. Zero in on something that you want to go after, something that you can hit with authority. Took a big rip, it's three and two. Aaron has an outstanding changeup. It's her out pitch. Does she go to it here on the 3 2? <laughs> Misses for ball four, and the tying run is aboard here in the seventh. Great at bat by Zoe Leno. We talked about her 
throughout this ball game about how she's worked her way to start in the lineup more consistently because of the quality at bats and professional at bats that she has up at the plate. And what a great way to get things going in the bottom of the seventh inning with your team down a run. Quality AB puts you on first base and pass the bat. Try to see if you guys can get a run, tie up this ball game, or even walk it off in the bottom of the seventh. Marissa Gonzalez will come on to run for Leno. Do not count out South Carolina. 12 of their 28 wins this season have come in their final at bat. Down a run here in the seventh and here is Cummings. 0 for 2 with a walk, trying to bunt Fouls it off for strike one. Cummings will pull the bat back and slap it out to left field. Coming on quickly and not getting there is Kramer. No one covering third, but they rally quickly, does Arkansas. And that means Gonzalez holds it second. Cummings with a bloop single, and South Carolina's got something cooking here in the seventh. I don't know if that single could have been more perfectly placed off the bat of Cummings. You can see where the infield was shifted. Shortstop Spencer Priggy is playing practically on second base. Arkansas was anticipating that she was going to try to lay down a sacrifice bunt in that situation. She mishits that one so well that it drops out in front of the diving Reagan Kramer out in left field, and now two aboard in the bottom of the seventh. Here is Kiana Jones. Jones lays down the bunt. The throw goes over the first. The sacrifice is successful. The tying run at third. The winning run at second with one down. Fundamental softball right there, laying down a sacrifice bunt. Make sure it's down in fair territory before she took off to first base. And just how quickly, when it seemed like all the momentum was on. Interesting move here by Coach Beth Smith. Not too often do you see a lefty batter being brought in to pinch hit against a lefty pitcher. And coming into this ball game, Robin Heron had a 185 batting average against left-handed batters this season. Pretty good numbers. 19 hits and 95 at-bats for Shelton this season. The freshman takes ball one. Well, you have to figure something out of We talked about the struggling offense, and Shelton in SEC games is four for 22 on the season, 182. But as Maddie just pointed out, she has success against left-handed pitching. And that's what she's facing right now in Heron. The 1-0. In the dirt, it's 2-0. And as a batter in this situation, too, you feel that the pressure is all on the pitcher in the circle. Two runners in scoring position, so many different options that you can bring that tying run across. And Robin Heron not commanding the zone in this inning like we've seen her do in her previous innings. There's a strike, it's 2-1. Here's the two one. Three and one. Close take on the lower part of the zone. And we've typically seen Heron work the upper part of the zone with the curve ball and the rise ball, but trying to take away any chance of a sack fly out to the outfield, working the low part of the zone. And just when you think you know what's coming, she comes in with the rise ball for a big swing and miss there. Three and two, the count to Shelton. Swung on and missed. Heron gets a big strikeout, two down. Shelton found herself in the count that she wanted to be in, a 2-0 count, a 2-1 count. 
and ends up swinging a couple of pitches well outside of the strike zone. These ones never even started in the zone, but Heron taking advantage of the fact that she was being aggressive on the rise balls and a big strikeout for out number two. Here's Bree Warren who takes ball one. Warren, before her last at bat, was 0 for 10 against left handed pitching this season. But in her last plate appearance, she had a single against Heron. 1 for 3 tonight. The 1 0. Swung on, line drive to right, and into the glove of Carter to end the ball game.